Hello, I'm Alistair McIntyre of ElectricScotland.com and this is my kind of, um, um, we talk about the newsletter which I do on a weekly basis but sometimes I suddenly decide that it might be a good idea to actually do a, a, a video version of the newsletter and so every number of weeks and it could be a couple of months, three months before I do another one but I thought from time to time it would be nice to just have a wee chat with you to tell you what's going on the, um, over the last few weeks we've been doing all kinds of things with the newsletter. Uh, in fact I've started to add a, a story um, every week and these stories are quite often about 15 pages in length. But I thought I'd try one um, and I announced it and, and put it into the newsletter. But I didn't get any feedback at all although I asked for it. So the following week I didn't put up a, a story at all there and then all of a sudden I got some emails saying hey we like the story yeah we want, we want more of those so uh, because of that I've now started to do a story with every newsletter I mean the first one I think I put up was about living in the Isle of Skye in the old days how people lived how they dressed how they worked and all that kind of stuff uh, the one the other week that I did was about fires and firesides um, you probably know the phrase lang may your lum reek and that's basically saying uh, long may your chimney smoke but that was actually done on the basis that coal uh, in the middle of the 19th century was getting very expensive and it was in short supply as well as being expensive and so there was a paper given by the I think it was the Gaelic Society in Inverness about fires and firesides and in there uh, the, um, uh, the guy giving the talk was, was talking about how to make the fire burn hotter and longer uh, and also discussing fuel in general about how to get fuel from various sources and he went on to discuss how some of the European countries were handling um, fuel like peat and uh, as well as coal and coke and so forth uh, and so I thought that would give you a background to that phrase of lying by your lum reek. Uh, and, and it's also, of course, today, I mean, with electricity and gas, I mean, there's very few people that really rely now on coal, especially for uh, cooking. But there are people that live off the grid which do use coal or peat or whatever to uh, heat their homes and cook their meals. So for those small minority of people, it would be very relevant to, to learn uh, what this talk was uh, all about. But it also helps you to look back at the days when we didn't have electricity and gas and so forth and realize that uh, there were challenges back in those days. The, um, the key to these stories is I'm picking them because I feel that they're educational I'm hoping they'll be interested, they'll enjoy the read and learn something from them. But uh, I'm trying to pick different topics that, uh, so I'm not going to try and give you all of the same type of story. I want to kind of mix it. The one this current week, when the newsletter goes out on Thursday night, is, um, is going to cover the Highland garb. Because there's been a lot of misinformation given out about how old the kilt is and, and stuff like that. So I thought this was again a talk given by the Gaelic Society of Inverness and I thought it was quite instructive to let you know the, the history of the kilt and, 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 and the dress of, uh, of, of, of Scots. So I'm hoping you'll enjoy that in this current newsletter going out. The newsletter also does feature uh, electriccanadian.com which is another of the sites that I run. Uh, in that particular case it's similar to Electric Scotland in that it uh, covers the history and culture and heritage of Canada rather than Scotland. And um, in that particular case, uh, I follow up on themes. Uh, I mean, one of the things that interested me recently was the fact that I saw a statement saying that um, foreign arrivals in Canada have been steadily declining over the past 11 years, which actually appalled me. I mean, I mean, I do understand that because Canada has so much to offer. And so I did a lot of research and I actually did two YouTube videos about 
my research, uh, plus supplied some PDF files for people to read. So, you know, I, I do take those kind of subjects and kind of do a fair bit of research myself and then put my findings up on the site and, of course, announce it in the weekly newsletter. I mean, I will say as a general um, comment, I, I've always felt the tourism trade is pretty pathetic. They don't seem to have any idea or have any real... They don't seem to look at innovation. I mean, if these were private industries, they'd be dead and gone by now, or people would have been sacked. It's as simple as that. And I'm not just saying about the tourist industry in Canada, I'm talking about the tourist industry in Scotland and America, in New Zealand, in Australia, in China, in Poland, any country in the world. The tourism industries in all of those countries, in my view, are pathetic. They all lie to you. They give you figures which are not accurate and if you ask them how do you come up with these figures no one will tell you and our politicians are not asking these questions that's probably because if they delved in deep then people might delve in deep into whatever the MP themselves say to them to you and they don't want to be scrutinized when they come up with their figures either so on the whole, the tourism trade, in my view, in general, is pretty pathetic. And it's time that we really got more privatisation into it and call people to account. Because too many people see it's a safe, secure little niche and they don't want to rock the boat. But that isn't going to translate into more tourists, as we've seen in Canada. So I'm, I can be pretty nasty and, and horrible to sectors where I believe the truth isn't being given. But then the other part of the newsletter is that I try to give you information that is uh, interesting and educational, because after all I see my site as being very much an educational site. The, one of the things I, 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 I've been doing recently is that I, I've covered the, the referendum in Scotland but along with that, I've been able to get documents from the Scotland UN Committee. Now, I have to tell you, I would guess that 99% plus of people have never heard of the Scotland UN Committee. But by the end of the day, it was their work that actually got Scotland a devolved government. And on the site, we have today the full story of how they achieved that. And this isn't just taking it out of the air. These are papers that there are copies of those on record. You can read them for yourselves. And this week, I'm delighted to say we've been able to put up a complete introduction to this set of papers we've put up. And if you read it, as it references a paper, there's a hyperlink. So you can click the link and actually read the paper in full depth. But the introduction is a really good summary of what they achieved. And it's the only independence movement in Scotland over the last 300 years that actually achieved something concrete, i.e. a devolved government in Scotland. It was the work of the UN Committee only that achieved that. Not the SNP, not Labour, not Tory. It was the work of the Scotland UN Committee working with the world and working in Scotland that achieved it. And really, you should read that introduction sheet, even if you don't read the individual papers. I think it's well worth knowing how we got to where we are today in Scotland. Also, um, I'm covering various books, as I've always done, because every week there's a new book going up on the site. I'm either putting it up as a because I've OCR'd the book in, and therefore it goes up chapter by chapter. And the reason it goes up, by the way, chapter by chapter, is that some years ago, um, I offered to put up the whole book. But so many people said, we just don't have the time to read a whole book. And so I suggested that, well, how about if I get the book done, and then I'll put up a chapter a day or a chapter a week until it's complete. And I got tons of emails at that time saying that, yes, we would prefer it that way, because that way we'll have time to read it. 
And in fact, just very recently, I did ask the question again whether you would want me to actually put the whole book up on a one And I got, again, uh, well, not many, but I got maybe 30-odd emails, something like that, saying, no, no, we're perfectly happy with a chapter a week or the chapter or a chapter a day. So I continued to do that, basically. I mean, if you're a poem that just likes to read the whole book, all you need to do is wait until the announcement in the newsletter will say, we've now completed this book. And when you see that, click the link and you can read the whole book in a one uh, But that's what I do with the newsletter, is because I want to tell you what I put up in the last week. And so when a new book comes out, I'll give you the whole preface from it. Maybe I'll give you a bit of an introduction uh, to, the, uh, to, to one of the chapters to give you an idea of how it reads. Uh, and then the following week, I'll be telling you I've added another X number of chapters to, to this book. And again, you'll get the link to read the latest chapters. So that's how I kind of work with that. But as well in the newsletter, there's going to be uh, individual articles that I've got from somewhere or other. Um, one of the uh, things is that I do work with a lot of antiquarian magazines. And when I find a new magazine or a different one, I might go through it and say, well, the whole is not really of interest, but I can see three articles within it, which I think would be well worth reading. And so what I'll do is I'll extract the three articles and put them up on the website. So that's how I kind of go with, uh, with, with the newsletter. Also, there are some bits of news that come out from time to time. And uh, I think, well, th that might well be of interest to you. So I'll pop it up as the Electric Scotland News. Um, I mean, for example, there's a new... A uh, Monopoly game come come out. This it, it's for Scotland. It's focused on Scotland. That Monopoly game. So I thought, well, I know a lot of people play Monopoly. They might be interested in that, and I put that up. I also always provide within the newsletter a link to our Scottish news feed, because I do my own personal trawl of the news sites uh, during the um, each day, and if I find news that I think is interesting. Uh, I'll put a link to it on the newsfeed. Now, the newsfeed's always available from our index page. You just click on letterscotton.com. You go there. If you scroll down, you'll see the newsfeed. Click on any of the stories. I send you to where, where the, you can read the news, and that could be on any of the news sites. I really don't bother with sport much at all, because there's plenty of places you can go if you want to follow a team. And I don't really follow all the murders and disgusting stories that come out. But uh, I will follow uh, political, major political or business stories, usually within that Scots news feed. And sometimes a cultural story comes out, which I think is well worth relating. So there's a wee mix of stories. Uh, some, some days there's very little news. Others there's a lot. So I, I can put up maybe a dozen stories one night and maybe only one or two the following night. So it kind of depends. Usually I keep about a week's stories worth up on that news feed. So you can come back and read a few of the older ones. Um, I also have a section in the newsletter for specifically Electric Canadian. I mean, Electric Canadian is really the same as Electric Scotland, albeit uh, Electric Canadian has now been going for three years, whereas Electric Scotland has been going for 18 years. So, but there's a, a whole ton of information up uh, on the Electric Canadian side. But I, I only really work on that when I've got the time. When I first set it up, I did a lot of work on it to give a lot of background information so you could learn about the history of the whole of Canada, but also the history of each of the provinces. And I've done a, a big story on the makers of Canada, the people that really made a difference uh, to the country. Um, and since then I've been adding significant Canadians when I've heard of them. It's like uh, Stomping Tom Connor, for example, being a fairly new, uh, fairly new um, resident in Canada. I never heard of him until he died, unfortunately. But when I listen to some of his stories uh, and songs, it's, they're all about Canada. I mean, the guy was phenomenal. So I, I put up a feature page about him. And since then, if I hear of any other artists that I think are particularly outstanding, uh, I'll make a page for them as well. And it's like Electric Scotland. I'm always looking for contributions from other people. <coughs> um, 
So if you've got a story about a sector of Canada or, or some heritage information or history information, feel free to send it in. I'm always looking for good stories to add. We also have been hosting the Flag in the Wind ever since it started. Because back in Scotland, um, when I got my elected Scotland site going, I did go to all the newspapers in Scotland to see if any of them wanted to work with me. And none of them did, apart from the Scots Independent newspaper. And so for the first number of years, I actually hosted their site for them and actually integrated it into Electric Scotland. But as the years went by, we, we eventually got them to have their own domain, which they now got. Um, but they still incorporate our main menu uh, on the top of their site. I suppose it's because they're all to do with the politics of independence in Scotland. And of course my site gives a whole ton of information, so by using my common menu, it means people reading that site can easily get to other information on Scotland. But that may change in the, in the years ahead, because I think the, if you remember like the editor of the Scots Indian newspaper, I think he said he was 83 now, so probably not going to go on for much longer. So when someone new takes over, things will change. Um, as far as... Um, Electric Scotland goes, uh, again, it's just the question that I'm putting up lots of stories. Uh, I mean, we've started on the, the story of a working man. It's actually, um, when I first read the story, uh, I, the first few chapters were to me amazing because he actually wrote this book with the idea that it was for his son because he figured that he would die before his son was old enough to really understand everything. And he wanted to tell his son about his grandparents and his parents and, and obviously what they did and how they lived and stuff like that. So, um, but then he got into certain political areas in his own life and it was decided to release the book early because a lot of the happenings that were going on in, in the UK at the time uh, he was covering in his book and people thought it would be worthwhile that people at that time could read what he had to say about it. Uh, and he was quite involved in, in many respects in these goings on. So what you've got with this story of a working man is um, an extremely detailed account of how people lived in the old days. And it's one of the better accounts that I've really ever come across. I mean, there's bits that tell you they lived in a hut, and that hut had no windows. But the one thing they had was they'd taken a pane of glass with them from the last several houses, so they were able to cut a wee hole in the wall and put a pane of glass in. But it was a hut, there was no petitions or anything, just that bare hut. And that's where the family basically lived. And you, you don't really get accounts like that. Uh, or you can't find them very easily for sure. So when I came across this book, and it goes on to explain how they made their living and, and the work that they did, and it's in quite some detail as well. So I just thought it was fascinating, and I I'm hope if you have been reading along so far, you'll be enjoying that read. But we will continue that. We'll probably be finished it by next week, and then we'll move on to another story. Uh, also, at the end of the newsletter, I have I previously worked on the book of the Scottish Anecdote. Now, the book of the Scottish Anecdote, it, some stories are very small, but others are, are quite long. But it's basically giving you a wee insight into the Scottish mind and the way things work. I mean, last week I was talking about Hockey's legacy. Hockey was a, a beggar, basically in Edinburgh, but he was a character. Um, and so lots of people would meet him and talk to him. And so uh, a lot of the wee accounts are, are, are these people that have told stories about meeting hockey and, and what hockey had to say at the time, because it was quite a raconteur by all accounts. So some of the wee stories about hockey I thought were quite interesting. Um, so, so that's what the, the newsletter is basically about. Uh, I'm finding that... Um, I'm making a little bit more use of uh, YouTube because when I put a story up of an area of Scotland, I'm trying to go to YouTube to see if there's any videos. 
because over the years, I, I, any time I put up a book about a place in Scotland, or for that matter now a place in Canada, I've usually gone to that place to try to write to the mayor or the council or the economic or tourism departments of these areas or the library to see if there's anything they can offer like pictures or, or any additional information. And without exception, they've all been exceptionally good at giving me absolutely nothing. I mean, this is where I just simply don't understand it. If you want to promote your area, then whoever writes about your area, surely it's got to be a plus. Can't be a minus. It's got to be a plus. But no one's interested in giving anything. I think we've got a very greedy attitude these days. I mean, thank God, all I can say is, in the old days, Scots wrote tons about their areas, about their businesses, and all kinds of things. And so we now can fall back on that. But I'm afraid in another hundred years' time, if you want to come back to this particular century, you're going to find nothing. Nothing of substance at all. And I think that's a huge difference. And I don't know, I mean, we talk about the internet as being a, a fabulous communications resource. But it's not. You get tweets. 25 words, is it? Tweet. That's all you get. I mean, you can't tell a story with 25 words, sorry. Facebook, there's a limit there as well. But everyone's chatting about me, me, me all the time. They're not giving. And I think that's, uh, that's sad, in my view. I think we've totally lost. The, 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 the web was um, meant to be for cooperation, sharing, collaboration. It's not. It's all about me. So if I've got a website, I'm not interested in sharing with anyone else. You want my information? Come to my website. That's wrong. We should be sharing, big time. But we're not doing that, unfortunately. Um, and I don't know where we're going to go. I think maybe the new generation who seem to be getting a bit fed up of Facebook and stuff like that and realizing they don't really want to have all their public stuff up and, and exposed maybe they'll start to look at alternative ways of communicating. I mean, I'm always interested in receiving articles about any aspect of life um, or a charity. But even charities won't give you a story about themselves. Go to our website. That's the answer. And sorry, you can't be bothered to give me a story. I can't be bothered to give you a link to your website. Sorry. Bye. However, uh, that's when I get in the newsletter because sometimes I take a bit uh, of um, a case up and so sometimes I'll give a little bit of a rant about something but that's just me that's what I've done over the years ain't going to change now that's for sure but I am more than willing to change the newsletter if someone says this is what we'd like to see can you do more of this can you do more of that but I say unless I get feedback I don't know what you're thinking I'm not um, I can't see into your brains all I can see is the number of people that get it and read it, um, which is a good number, a hundred, certainly. Uh, but however, at the end of the day, unless I get the feedback, I can't change anything, really. Or if I make a change, it's because I think, well, maybe I'll make a change. Hence, adding the story. Because I'm hoping that by adding the story, it'll educate you. Hopefully, it'll be interesting, so you'll enjoy the read. Uh, but who knows? I mean, I, it may not continue. Maybe people will decide it's too much to read. We want to unsubscribe, please. I haven't seen it happening so far, but it's early days, so we'll just see how it goes. But anyway, that's what I've been doing with the newsletter, is uh, trying something new by adding this story in. But, I'll con but the main thrust of it is always to give you an easy way of finding out what's new on the site that in the past week. That was always the purpose of the newsletter. And so if I'm adding something new, I'll give you a bit of a description of what it is about. So I won't just give you, yes, we added this book, here's the link to it. I'll actually give you a bit of background about the book and maybe include a, a bit of one of the chapters so you can see how it reads. And so you're better able to decide if that's something you want to bother reading and click therefore clicking on the link to go read it. So that's what the purpose of the newsletter is. Um, and as I say to that, well, just recently I've decided to add this larger story. Because some people have said, uh, um, in fact, I got a few that actually said that they go to work by train. And so what they actually do is they print out the newsletter. 
And so when they're on their way to work uh, on the train, they can actually read the news down. Um, and I suppose some of them are doing that now with tablets, so they can click on a link and read something online if they want to. But uh, in the older days, I suppose, they just read it and think, oh, I must remember when I get home or get to work, I'll click on this link and read more. But that's the purpose of the newsletter, it's just to keep you up to date with what's new in Elective Scotland. And if you remember of our community, which is electiscotland.org, uh, you can, uh, I put all the newsletters up there, and you can actually subscribe to that forum. So if you were to subscribe to the forum, when I put a newsletter up, you'll automatically get an email saying there's been a new addition to the forum, and they'll give you a link, so if you click the link, it will go directly to the newsletter. And of course, in every email like that, there's always a link for you to unsubscribe if you decide you don't want to get this weekly reminder, as it were. So um, that's where you can subscribe yourself to newsletter and unsubscribe it whenever you want. So if you're going away for a few weeks somewhere, you can simply go to the electiscotland.org site and just click on the wee subscribe link and then click unsubscribe. Then when you get back, you can go back there and resubscribe after you get back. So you can. You, you can decide how to do it yourself. You can also get what they call a weekly digest or, or get them as they go up. I try not to... There's an odd person that will reply to the newsletter uh, and I'm conscious that if they do reply to it that message will also get sent out to you. And of course if I reply to that my reply will also get sent out to you all. And not everyone wants that. Um, so that's why you can ask for a weekly digest so if you get the digest, when you get the link for it, if there were any replies and my replies, then you can read them there with the one link, basically. So these are, these are options that you can get to read that. As I say, if you, if you like, I mean, my interest in Canada was that I didn't realize it was so Scottish, to be honest. I mean, it seems that a very high number of the really big players that make Canada what it is today were Scots. And you can, you, I, I don't think you can go any to any town anywhere in Canada that hasn't got a Scots somewhere in the community because we spread all over Canada. And there weren't really that many what I would call Scottish enclaves. I mean, you might see Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, PEI were particularly Scottish. Um, and yet, Today they don't seem to be interested in the Scottish heritage at all. They certainly won't share anything with us anyway, which is a big disappointment. But it's the choice of the people of today that decide what happens. And obviously the people of today aren't interested, so we don't really get as many stories as we might have in the old days. But that's life. I think things keep changing. So anyway, there you go. I won't wrap it on any longer. But uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this uh, newsletter. It'll be going out Thursday night. And uh, you'll enjoy the new story in it. And also the particular article on the Scotland UN Committee, which really, if you're interested in the history of Scotland at all, and certainly the modern history, that is just a phenomenal introduction of how the Scotland UN Committee worked the world. And that means including working uh, with the Queen, uh, the US Congress, uh, you know, the European Union, everyone. I mean, they got involved worldwide to make sure we got to the point where we had a Scottish devolution. And I think that story is well worth reading. And it's factual and can get backed up by actual papers. There is one additional uh, paper that will come out uh, on that section, and that is the sources. One of the things they made a point at is that there are enough source material that will back up everything they've claimed, but there is more available. But the thing is, it's still under the um, the Secrecy Act, so it's the Foreign and uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office. They still need to release papers, and some of the cabinet papers as well have not have yet to be released over that particular period that they were working on. But I think the intention is, once they are released, uh, they will be documented, and that will complete the the, the whole. Um, saga of the Scotland UN Committee. So there you go. Um, hope you've enjoyed this wee chat and uh, maybe I'll do another one sometime. Nice talking to you. Look forward to hearing from you.